show. I don't think we finished the uh, Exodus chapter 21 last week, and we're just going through several miscellaneous law. And we're not going to look at the whole thing here, but we're just going to look at a few things here. Let's take a look at verse 23 from chapter 21. It says, But he's not to be punished if the slave gets up after a six uh, after a day or two since the slave is his property if men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman and she gave birth to prematurely but there is no serious injury the offender must be fined whatever the woman husband demands and the court allows but if there is a serious injury you are to take the life for life eye for eye tooth for tooth, and hand for hand, and foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. So let's just take a quick look at this one. We probably know or heard of this particular law that, you know, God is asking life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. When you hear this message, what does it really mean to you? Being fair? at this it starts off if men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman and she gave birth prematurely but there is no serious injury the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and court allowed but if there is serious injury injury you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and hand for hand, and foot for foot, and burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. So that sounds like, okay, so if this is the law from the Lord, if someone hit me, then I, I should hit him back. If he does something harm to me, then I should harm him too. Well, if that's the God's law, then it sounds like what's so different from this world's law? Isn't that what we do here? And the human law is the same, same thing. You know, we pay for what we receive. Is that going to be fair if we actually do this? Mm-hmm. So the way it starts is if someone hit pregnant woman, that's how it starts. And then if it's not serious, then whatever her husband demands and the court allows, you have to pay back. If it's a serious, then life for life, eye for eye, and tooth for tooth. If it is a serious, so who's who's harmed? Who is harmed here? The pregnant woman was harmed, right? So 
the husband is claiming for the damage. And if it's a serious life for life, the way it starts with life for life. So if they take, you know, the wife's life, you take his life too. So this is, it's justice. It's a law of justice that, you know, if someone takes the life, then you pay back with the life, right? So if that is the case, if that is the justice, and the law allows that boundary to really pay back the way you received. So imagine, if we damaged a woman, if we have to damage that woman, and if it takes her life, and we have to give our life. If it takes our eyes, they have to uh, take my eyes. If my tooth, I mean, if I hit tooth, and then they have to take my tooth. So it's it's almost a consequence, as you pointed out, we have to pay back. So is that God is teaching us to just do this? If that is the case, then isn't that a, a contradicting of what Jesus said, if someone slaps a left, you know, and then you just give to the, you know, the right cheek, right? That's different. You got hit, you pay back, right? That's how it's supposed to be, and that's a God's law. So we have a, every right to hit them back and pay back for what they had done. So if that is a God's law, then God also have to pay back for how they crucify the Jesus. Then God has to pay back for what he received then, according to God's law. So what if God pays, pays back for, for, for death? Then what, what happens then? Is is any any human being could ever you know, uh, you know survive? The God is not trying to teach to hit them back or just pay back for what they're doing. This is the the law that God God is teaching us. The justice that God is teaching us that this is what is supposed to happen. If someone damages my wife. Seriously, we will pay back the way you way you gave it to us. We'll pay back. If I have a sin against the God, then I should get paid back. That's the damage that I cause. And God will pay me back. Then if God pay me back for that, then I could never receive that payback because if he hit me, I'm dead. So God is teaching us this is what is supposed to happen and this is the consequences that will most you know it will follow. So God is te teaching us this is what you're supposed to receive. But you know what? I will waive this for you. But not just to forgiving you for free. Someone has to get pay back. Someone has to receive this. So God will hit you back. But instead of his hitting me back, there's someone else who will get hit. And, you know, instead of me, that is the Jesus uh, he will give to us. He will sacrifice his son to get hit. Because God cannot, because it's just as God, he cannot just uh, forgive for free. And he said, well, let's just clear this off without really hitting you back. It just can't happen. That's, that's not justice. So he will hit it back, but if, if God hit us back, it's going to severely damage us. So, instead of I'm hitting you, I'm going to hit my son. That's what this is about. So God is teaching us a consequence, and this is what is supposed to happen, but you are not going to get it. So, God is teaching us the rules and the law first, and then showing us what the grace means and how he will save us. And same thing, you know, he's teaching us this is the this is the justice system that it, this is how God follows the rule. If someone damages you, you have to pay back. So when we 
look at this verse 28 and on if a bull gores a man or a woman to death the bull must be stoned to death and it mu uh, its meat must not be eaten but the owner of the bull will not be held responsible if however the bull has had the habit of uh, goring and the owner has been warmed so uh, uh, warned but has not kept it uh, penned up and it's kill a man or woman the bull must be stoned and the owner must also must be put to death so the bull is the one who damage and kill others but not only bull have to be killed but also the owner of the bull has to be killed as well that is the consequence in verse 30 however if payment is demanded of him he may redeem in his life by paying whatever is demanded so what you can do is you can actually pay to redeem your life right so someone is paying you to redeem your life and who's doing this Jesus will so all this uh, the law that God is teaching us for any personal injuries but when you look at this there's a lot of injuries that could happen that you have to pay back or you have to give your life for that one so God is teaching us this is what is supposed to happen but later he will teach us although this is my justice system I won't do this and someone else will pay for you when you go to chapter 22 it's even worse if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep so it's getting worse now they stolen the sheep or they slaughtered the sheep or if they sell it not only you have to pay back but you have to pay back five times more so if you kill one you have to pay back five times and if you steal sheep there'll be four times so what if they actually kill someone would it be less than cattle or sheep or you pay more you'll pay more will pay more so it's not just a one-to-one -one. it's not life or life or eye to eye or tooth to tooth but if you have to pay back five times more well how are we going to pay back or how God will pay us back if there's a five times more four times more or even more than five times how will we be able to bear that payback this is what God is teaching us this is what it's supposed to happen this is the justice system according to God's law however this will be taken care of because I'm going to slaughter my son for this so it's not about one for one but one for two one for four or one for five So all this, the protection for properties is saying the same thing. The other law, you know, starting from verse 16 and on, it's also other, um, <coughs> the law that God teaches us. However, all these laws, when you look at it, God is just teaching us. He's just a system of how it's supposed to happen. In verse 28, it says, Do not blaspheme God or curse the ruler of your people. So what is God is teaching us? Don't ever judge God because he's the judge. And we cannot talk back to the judge when he gives a verdict. We cannot fight back. 
whatever he decide based on the judgment system this will be done regardless and God will do that so if you ever fight back if you curse you're gonna have to face the consequence chapter 23 do not spread the false reports do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness so do not gossip about things but do not help a wicked man by being malicious witness so don't work with those wicked people do not be united with them making sure that you separate yourself same thing God is calling us you are holy holy means be separated be different God separated Israel from the pagans God is distinguishing the Israelites from other pagans same thing God is teaching us you have to be different verse 10 for six years you are to saw your field and harvest the crop but building uh, during the seventh year let the la uh, let the land lie unplowed and unused then the poor among your people may get food from it and the wild animal may eat what they leave do not uh, do the same with your vineyard and olive grove six days do your work but on the seventh day do not work so that your ox and your donkey may rest and the slave born in your household and an and, and the alien as well may be refreshed be careful to do everything i have said to you do not invoke the names of other gods do not let them be heard on your lips so this is about the sabbath law so the six years people have to work they saw the field they have to harvest the crops but on the seventh year you have to rest the entire year has to rest to give a break and give a breathing room for the land this as I mentioned from the very beginning of Genesis I mentioned about the Sabbath day why God is repeating Sabbath day every week so God is teaching us that we have to enter into his rest that is what what why he is actually teaching this now verse 14 to three times a year you are to celebrate the festival to me celebrate the feast of unleavened bread for seven days eat bread make without yeast as I command commanded you do this at the appointed time in the mouth of Abib for in that mouth you came out of Egypt no one is to appear before me empty-handed celebrate the feast of a harvest with the first fruit of the crop you saw in your field celebrate the feast of in gathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field three times a year all the men are to appear before the sovereign Lord okay God is actually giving us the law that every man must appear three times a year and when do they have to show themselves up three times a year the first one is feast of unleavened bread second feast of harvest and third in gathering okay now recently there was a Jewish holiday so a lot of the people took day off at school what are the uh, the feast that we just they or they just had you don't know 
Okay. You probably heard of Rosh Hashanah. You heard of that, right? Rosh Hashanah. Do you know what Rosh Hashanah means? Rosh Hashanah means head of the year, which means it's the new year, the Jewish new year. This Rosh Hashanah is something that Jewish people made up. This Rosh Hashanah is the Feast of Trumpet. It's the same day. It's supposed to be Feast of the Trumpet, but they converted this and they diminished the meaning of the Feast of the Trumpet, but they promote the Rosh Hashanah to be the big feast. So they no longer celebrate the Feast of the Trumpet, but rather they celebrate Rosh Hashanah as a new year. The reason they do, they do this is because, first of all, Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the year. Remember I mentioned there are two calendars that uh, the Israelites use, right? There is a religious calendar and regular calendar more the civilian calendar, right? It The difference is there is about like seven month difference. And for religious calendar, God changed the calendar on the day that they were coming out of Egypt. So they made, you have to make this month to be the first month of the year. That was Abib month. So he swapped it. So the seventh month became the first month of the year according to religious calendar. But now original calendar that they had before the Passover was the seventh day, a seventh month so was the, uh, the Feast of the Trumpet. Now they call it Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah is the Feast of the Trumpet. So God told the Israelites, you have to, every man must show at least a three feasts a year. One is Feast of Unleavened Bread. Two, Feast of Harvest. Three, Feast of Ingathering. So, when you look at this, those three feasts has a relationship. The relationship between all three feasts is it is all during the harvest season. So what do they harvest during the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Do you know? They, they harvest ease. Well, uh, no, not fruit. So there are three different harvests in uh, in Israel. There are three different harvests. So the very first uh, harvest they do here is during the very first three uh, th the third month. They harvest wheat. Wheat. And the second harvest is barley. And third harvest is a fruit. So I mentioned Israelite have seven different feasts which I went over before, right? And during the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread, there is the Feast of First of, uh, 
first of fruits is in there. So that's the very first harvest, which is when they gathered the wheat. And second harvest is during Pentecost. They harvest barley. And third feast is feast of ingathering or the feast of Feast of Tabernacle. It's the same thing. Feast of Tabernacle. Feast of Ingathering. That's the same, same feast. But they harvest the fruit. So the very first harvest is wheat. Second harvest is barley. And third harvest is fruit. So they harvest in different times. So this three harvest is in the year, but God is actually requesting the man to show up before the Lord during these three harvest time. Why is that? That, that is the, the relationship that these three feast. It's the first First the feast, they harvest wheat. That is the time when Jesus Christ is resurrected, which he became the first of fruit. And second gathering is the Pentecost, which is also called the Feast of Weeks. That's when they harvest the church. And third, at the end time, he finally gathers all his believer. That is called the Feast of Tabernacle or Feast of Ingathering. But now question is, God is asking the Israelites to bring, the man to bring what? They have to bring something. They can't just come with the empty hand. Why? Why? God is asking. Okay, so, well, this is why many of the people use this particular verse and say, every time you come to worship service, you bring the offering. They use that. Right? Because God said, ev every time you come, don't come with empty hands. So that means God is asking us to bring something to him. Right? But is that really what he's asking? To bring money to him? Or the offering to him? Then what is he really asking then? Let's take a look at chap uh, Matthew chapter 6 Matthew chapter 6 when you look at the Matthew chapter 6 Jesus talks about you know to help out the people in need And then when you look at verse 19 and on, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where mouth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where mouth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be destroyed to, uh, to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So let's go back to what God said in Exodus. God said all man must show three times a year you must come before the Lord. But when you come, don't ever come to me with empty hand. So what is God asking? Exactly. So that's why verse 21 says in Matthew, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what is God asking? I want you to bring your heart. It's not about money. It's not about treasure is what I'm looking for. What I like to receive from you is your heart. So think about it. You know, you had a girlfriend. When you hang out with your girlfriend, right? Do you want to give her something? Is that because if she's asking you to give her something? Or you want to give something? Why? Exactly. She doesn't ask you. Sometimes if she does, might be. I don't know. But, <laughs> right? But the point here is, it's not about it's not about the gift that you give. But what she wants to receive from you is, do you love me? Is what she likes to see, right? And when you love someone, even though the person does not ask you to give something, you voluntarily you want to give something to that person, because you love that person, right? Same thing. If you truly love someone, you would give. But there are cases which you might have seen in your own experience or you have seen other people, right? There are women who want something. So they use the man to get what they want. They don't love that person. But they just want to use them to get what they want. There are people like that too. There are women like that too. They don't really care about that man. But I use you to give me what I like to, what I like to get. So then is that love? That's not love. Right? That's not the loving relationship. We give something. We give gift. Because we want to show that I love. So, for example, when people get married, and if a husband says, you know, at their wedding anniversary, or the Valentine's Day, or like their birthday, or like Christmas Day, whatever it may be, or a special occasion, right? And you buy something expensive gift and then you just give it to the you know wife and it says well here it is if you think just the buying a gift expensive gift and giving it to her is really love you're wrong 
what the woman wants to see is is not the it's not the gift itself what they want to see it's about the the heart that goes along with the gift is what they want to see when we bring offering to the lord what does he want to see from us is he asking us money because he needs some money from us no not really he doesn't need our money he claims that the whole world is mine so it's all his so how can we say like well this is my money i give it to you well this is not mine to begin with this is yours this is his so what are we going to do to bring his money and showing him and say well i'll give it to you it is yours anyway what's the point but god gave us god only takes one tenth of what he gave it to us and then he said you can keep the nine of it but give it to me one why because i want to see your heart do you really care for me do you really love me so if we give the offering to the lord during our church service or whatever it may be if you just to show off well i give a lot of money to church it doesn't mean anything to to god that's the exactly examples that Jesus was pointing out between the Pharisee versus a poor widow. When Pharisee put a lot of money into the to the basket, well, I gave this much. I fasted. I saved this money to give it to the Lord. Whereas. The poor widow have very little money. There's nothing compared to what Pharisee did. But she gave those a little money to the Lord and said, "Lord, this is all I can give." But that was everything that she had. So Jesus said, "So who gave the, the more? Is it the Pharisee who gave the more or the widow who gave the more?" Most people say Pharisee gave him more and Jesus said no this poor widow gave him more it's not about how much you brought what God cares is what you brought to the Lord where is your heart do you really give your heart to the Lord is what really cares it's not about the amount of money that you give to the Lord It's about do we love the Lord, and we are giving this to the Lord because of we love Him. Is what God counts. So this is why God said you cannot serve both God and money, because your heart will be either, not both. You cannot serve God and money at the same time. You either serve the Lord or you serve the money. One or the other, we may say, you know what? Don't worry, I'll manage it very well. You know, I'll balance it very well. I love the Lord, I love the money, so I'll balance it. No, God is saying, no, you cannot. Either, not both. You know, the recently Trump administration said, you pick. Are you with U.S. Are you with North Korea? You cannot, you cannot say I I I I deal with them both. No, one or the other. It's your choice. You you have a freedom to choose which one you want to choose. You either pick U.S. or you pick North Korea. One or the other. Same exact concept. Which one? You have a full freedom to choose. We will not force you which one to choose. You have a full freedom to choose, but you better be wise which one you will choose. So, that's what it really means, and God is asking us to bring something. Not empty hand. God never said bring a lot of money. God said, 
do not come to me with empty hands. So that's how we interpret, oh, that means God is asking my money. No, that's not what God is asking. Not at all. But why God is asking to bring during these three feasts, especially during the harvest time? Well, during the harvest time is where you get most of the, the stuff, right? Because you harvest it. So you want to keep it as much as you can. But God is saying, well, harvest time, you have everything. Now what can you offer to me? And as I mentioned, all these three feasts are related to harvest, which I mentioned about seven feasts, which we're going to go more details when we get to uh, Leviticus. Verse 18, do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. The fat of my festival offering must not be kept until morning. Bring the best of the first fruit of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Do not cook a young goat in its mouth, uh, mother's milk. So God is saying, do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with the anything containing yeast. What does that yeast mean? Correct. Sin. The Jesus' blood cannot be shared with sin. You cannot share that. We'll go to verse 20. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. So God is sending what? How many angels? How many people in promised land? One? <laughs> Countless of people are there. God is sending God is sending one angel to take care of it. That's the how powerful the angel can be. So God is saying, I will send an angel ahead of you to prepare everything. So if this angel is preparing everything, then what would Israel do? If angels takes care of everything, what's the point of having the war? Well, they had to fight, right? So what will they do? Isn't that almost the same thing as when Israel was you know, fighting against the Malachites? And Joshua and his, all his followers was, you know, at the battlefield, they were fighting. But the result of the war was determined by the Moses' hand. Whether he lift up his hand or lower his hand, that determined the result of the war. Not because he, you know, Joshua was brave or he was, he, all his, uh, you know, the men were so strong and they were able to defeat the Amalekites. It's got nothing to do with it. They were there. They had to fight. They had to do what they had to do. But everything was determined by God. So same thing. God is saying, go and take the land. Don't worry. I will send an angel ahead of you and prepare everything for you. But we always have a doubt. Will he? Will we be able to fight? Will we be able to you know, win this battle? They always had doubt. I mean, no, you know, no offense, but they had no faith. But what about us? Do we have a faith? If we are in their shoes, will we have faith? I don't think so. We'll be almost exactly the same or even worse than them. 
But this is what God is saying. I will send an angel in ahead of you and prepare the way for you. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of Amorites and Hittites and uh, Parasites and Canaanites and Hevites and Jebusites and I will wipe them out. Who will? I will. I will send this angel and have him take care of this one. So it is not you who's going to really fight and then win the battle but I will prepare everything. All you have to do is just go in and trust me that I will do this and take the land. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land. Uh, uh, I read that. Do not bow down before their God or worship them or follow their practice. You must demolish them and break their scared stone to pieces. A sacred the stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God and his blessing will be on your blood a food and water. I will take away sickness from among you and none will miscarry or barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their back and run. So who's doing the 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 you know the battle? The Lord will. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. But I will not drive them out in single ear because land would become desolate and wild animal too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. I will establish your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert uh, uh, to the river. I will hand over to you the people who live in the land and you will drive them out before you. Do not make covenant with them or with their gods. Do not let them live in your land or you will cause you to sin against me because the worship of their God will certainly be snared to you. Let's take a look at a few things here. God saying God will send the animal, I mean not animal, angel, and God will send the hornet to drive out the oldest people. But he won't do it in a single year. I will do it slowly. Because if I wipe them out ahead of you too early, there will be too much of a wild animal living in there. It will not be good for you. So I will keep them until the such time that you really need to advance into this land. Then when the time comes, I will send the hornet to drive them out. So it is about God doing all this work. It is not about Israel doing anything. So a lot of times we think, oh, we're doing work. or I'm doing such a good job here. Like I can do all this to, you know, for the Lord. Really? No. God is giving you the strength and God is actually preparing all this way for you to do your work. Not because you're superior. Not because you're so good. Not because you're so great. It's got nothing to do with you. When it, when it comes to God's work, we have nothing to boast about. We always said, you know what? I'm so good. You know, look at me. I'm, I'm doing such a great job. But what God is saying, really? Are you really? Are you kidding me? So, there's nothing to really show and present to God and say, Lord, I have done this much, so you bless me. Really? Without you knowing, God prepared everything for you ahead of time. There's nothing for you to really request. Imagine this. If you had done such a good work and you get paid, right? If you get paid, then you worked and you paid, right? You get paid. So that is just like transaction 
you gave your work and they paid you for what you have done. So that's a transaction. But if you have not done anything, but you get paid, it called grace. So, if you have done such a good job and you present it to the Lord, look, Lord, I have done such a good job here, now bless me. You call it a transaction. That's not God's blessing. You had done what you had done and you deserve to be, you know, get paid. But if God had done everything and you have nothing to present and show off that you had done so much, then it is grace. Because God had done everything for you. But a lot of people forget. Especially people who do a lot of God's work. They think they had done something. I prepared this. I did this. I did that. I went there. I... And as I've been teaching all this time. We have nothing to really tell God. As I have done so much that I am deserved to receive your blessing so you must bless me no it is God's blessing because we have done nothing and when you look at verse 31 you will find something interesting here I will establish your borders from Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert to the river This means God will give this promised land to the Israelites. But God is telling them, listen, I will set the border for you. It's not like I'm giving the whole world to you. I'm giving you a certain portion of the land to you, to, to Israelites. So this is how much I'm giving it to you. And later on, when we get to Joshua, when they enter into the promised land and Joshua divided all this land to each individual tribes and each tribe gets a certain portion of the land and this is for, for their land, right? Imagine, what if the each tribe then said, well, I understand that this is, this is my land that you, you know, allocated to me, so this is allotted to entire, you know, um, our tribe. But you know what? Uh, can I actually kind of like expand my territory? All right? Can I just take more of land from the other tribe? What if I advance into their tribes? Can I take that land? Yes? What do you think? Will God allow that? Or whatever was allocated is all they have. What do you think? Well, God gave them, you know, the border, right? So can they expand the border? If God gave them a border, I will establish your borders. When God sets the border, this is it. You don't go beyond the border that I set and establish for you. Okay? This is where people get confused. So let's just turn to some interesting uh, passage here. Let's turn to First Chronicle chapter four. First Chronicle chapter four. We're going to read from verse 9 and 10. 
Yabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Yabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Yabez ca- uh, cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. This is a well known as the prayer of Yabez. So the way he prayed was, Enlarge my territory, Lord. So people, for a while, they were just went viral about the prayer of Yabez. So everyone was praying, Expand and enlarge my territory, Lord. Expand, continue to expand. So what, is that, what does that tell you? I will go beyond the border. Expand my territory. This is what you allotted to me, but I will continue to expand. So I will conquer the world. I will take over all this Israel land. Is that what God allowed? So then, what is this a prayer of Yabez then? I mean, this isn't this what, you know, a lot of people pray for, like, enlarge my territory, Lord, Lord, right? Is that really what God wanted? And everyone says, God granted Jabez's wishes. This, we need to have a big heart. We, need, we have to request for more. Really? Is that really line up with what God is saying? Is that really what it means? No. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with that mean. God sets the border. God did not allow them to just continue to expand and conquer the other world. Right? Otherwise Israel should have gone into a other other territory and then continue to just, you know, advance their land, right? And expand your territories and make it bigger. Why not? No. This is why God sets the the border. This is it. I'm only giving it to you this much. From here to here. Do not take over any other border. Do not expand. I set the border for you. And God is saying, Do not worship other God. Do not worship dear God. Because if you, if you live with them, eventually you will serve dear God. So this is what most people, including the Israelites, believe this. Right, I see. Okay, so we should have drive out all this, you know, the people of, you know, the Canaan. And then we should never worship other God so we have to work very hard to not to worship other God but to worship our God okay so what church is teaching us is that you have to only serve the Lord do not ever serve other God let me tell you this entire Bible teaches us that all these people for all this time for thousands of thousands of years all these people have failed to do so isn't that the history of uh, Old Testament and also in New Testament all they show is everyone failed regardless of who they are they all failed then what is God teaching us then You can do it? No. What God is telling us, we as a human will never be able to do this ourselves. No matter how hard you try, you will fail. You will not be able to serve only God. You will fail. Is what God is teaching us. Because this is our belief and this is what most Christians believe. I can train myself, I can practice myself, I can just, you know, only serve the Lord. 
So I have to work hard to only serve the Lord. That's what Pharisees did. We will never worship other gods. We will only worship our Yahweh. We will do that. But they failed. What God is teaching you. This is who you are. No matter how hard you try, you will fail. This is why I need, this is why you need me. If you can do it by yourself, then you don't need me. Because you cannot do it, this is why you need me. Because with your own ability, I know you will not be able to do this. So this is the part where we need to learn. I see, I cannot do this myself. No matter how hard I try, I will miserably fail. So Lord, I can't do this. So I come before you, Lord. I'm asking you to help me so that I can do this through your power and through your Holy Spirit. So hold me tight, Lord, because I will continue to look somewhere else. I'm going to continue to lose you. I'm going to continue to, you know, to release you from my heart. So Lord, hold me tight and bring me under your wing, Lord, because I could never do this by myself. Help me. This is where we need to be. Chapter 24. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord you and Aaron, Nedab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The other must not come near, and the people may not come up with them. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's word and law, they responded with one voice, Everything the Lord has said, we will do. And I want you to just put an underline of what they said. When Moses said, when Moses said, I will tell you what God said to me and the law God told me. And they all responded. Who responded? Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of the Israel, which is the leaders of the Israel. They all raised one voice and said, Everything the Lord has said, we will do. Such a liar. Such a liar. It just... Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up twelve stone pillars representing twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offering and sacrificed young bulls and fellowship offering to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in the bowls and other half he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, they will do everything the Lord had said, we will obey. Just put on the line. Such a liar. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So here's the thing, as I mentioned, they said everything that what Lord said, we will do and we will obey. You know what they did? Remember, when did this happen? When did this happen? When Moses went up to the mountain. Right? When Moses went up to the mountain, and right before he went up to the mountain, this is what happened. Okay? And then continue on. Moses and Aaron, uh, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders 
of Israel went up and saw God of Israel under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of Israel. They saw God and they ate and drink, drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablet of stone with the law and the commands I have written for their instructions. So this is before Moses received the stone tablets, right? This is why God is calling him up to the mountain to, to receive those two stone tablets. Then Moses set out with Joshua, his, uh, his aide, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you, Aaron and her are with you, and anyone involved in a dis, uh in a dispute can go to them. When Moses went up on the mountain and cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, for six days the cloud covered the mountain and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud to the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a, a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up uh, when on up the mountain he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights so this is when Moses went up to the mountain 40 days and 40 nights to receive the two stone tablet with the God's Ten Commitments and uh, the rest of the law right when he was up there during those 40 days and 40 nights what did the Israelite do No. Turn to chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow, Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered him, Take off the gold earrings and that your wives and your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron, and he took the handed him and made it into an idol cast in a, sh a shape of calf, it into a, a, a fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought, uh, brought you out of Egypt. What did they say before the Moses went up to the mountain? What, what, what did they say? We'll do everything what God said, and we'll obey what God said, right? And who said that? Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they said, "We'll do everything." And what did I say? Why did I actually just you know put an underline there? These are liars. It did not take 40 days for them to do this. It only took 40 days to make the golden calf. This is not about Israel. You know what? This is us. When we go to, you know, Sunday worship service, it's like, Lord, we will serve you, we will obey you, we will follow your way. And Tuesday goes, and Wednesday goes, we'll do everything what we want. That's no different. Exactly the same thing. So, when they said, we'll obey Lord's way. Everything he taught us, we will do this. 
And do you think God knew what they will do? Yes. So this is what they did. So this is what God told Moses to do. Look at it, verse 8 again. Oh, actually, let's read it from 7 and 8. 7. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. You know what that means? You will not obey. You will not obey. So, because you are all this wicked people, that's why you need the blood. So I will sprinkle it over you. And what does it show? The blood of the Christ who was slaughtered because you're such a liar. God already knows that you won't keep this word you said. You're such a liar. This is why you need the blood of Christ. So I will sprinkle over you because this is the only way that I can salvage you or save you or redeem you. Period. This is why he said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And then, when you look, when Moses went up to the mountain, what did God say? Verse 16. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain. Six days you cannot go up. And on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. On the seventh day he goes up to the mountain. That goes back to everything what I said in Genesis. Six days of a creation and seventh day he rested. So on the seventh day, God will call us up. So we go up to the mountain to meeting the Lord. When that happens, to the Israelite, the glory of the Lord that looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. So, Moses going up, we go up. That's what it means. Okay, so chapter 25 is, uh, that's the starting point of the tabernacles. So, I want to, uh, so we're going to get into the tabernacle, uh, but I want to save it for next week. So I want to uh, have other peoples uh, to listen to this tabernacle.